And as we conclude this teaching series, best sermon ever, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has taken three chapters in our uh, printed copy of uh, God's Word, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and we are closing this this teaching series that has been about 16 weeks. We've been uh, looking at this sermon on on the mount about 16 weeks. This uh, this this sermon on the mount. Today we're going to press in on this this truth. I would encourage you to write it down and consider it as we look to the Word of God. Choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. The right decision, the right choice leads to life. The wrong decision, the wrong, conse- uh, the, the wrong choice leads to, to death. And as Jesus closed this, this, this section of scripture, this great sermon on the mount, what we see before us in this text is the tale of two. The tale of two. We have, we have decisions, we have choices. Look to the first, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. The first that we see is two kinds of of gates. Jesus refers to two kinds of gates, the narrow gate, and, and the, the broad gate, the narrow gate, and the broad gate. In biblical times, uh, the town would be surrounded by a uh, wall, and there would be, depending on the size of the population, there would be uh, w- at least one gate. <laughs> you got to get in, right? Uh, and so, and you got to get out. Uh, uh, but, but one, if not several, throughout, scattered around, around the wall. And, and so in this imagery, I love how Jesus, as we study the Gospels, what we see is he taught with imagery because it helped people connect to what he was saying. And, and so consider the, the gate. There's a, there's a picture here that will, that, that will help you consider this. This is a, 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 an ancient entrance. And we see, uh, obviously, the narrow gate is open. That narrow door is, is open. But then there's a much broader one. Depending on the, the celebration, the festivities, whatever might be drawing people to the specific town, they would then open up the, the bigger gate so more people could come in. Uh, but typically they use the narrow gate. And Jesus, is, what is he teaching us? He's teaching us that there's two gates, two decisions that you have to, to consider. The broad one is the one that more people are walking through. And oftentimes we get caught up in just doing what everyone else is doing. Why? 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 Because, uh, man, sometimes we don't want the heat, we don't want the criticism, or it's just that much harder. And we talk often about making the hard decision. I challenge you quite often, church, to for us to make the choose the hard decision. Jesus teaches that the narrow gate, the, the smaller one, that few are walking through. That gate leads to life. Not everyone's going that way. And that's the gate I want to go. The broad one, everyone's going. It's easier. Jesus says that that gate leads to destruction. And so I tell you today, only you can make the choice. Which gate will you walk through? The narrow or the broad? Jesus said this, John 10, 9, would you write that reference down? I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come and in and go out and find pasture. I am the gate, Jesus says. He's the one. If you remember last week, we looked at the progression of intensity of prayer. Ask, search, knock. Ask, search, and knock. And what does Jesus say? Keep on knocking and I will open the door. Keep on knocking. There's two kinds of gates. Which one will you choose? Look to verse 15. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them. Do you see this? You'll recognize them by their fruit. 
Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The, the next tale of two that we see that Jesus teaches is our two kinds of prophets. There's two kinds of prophets, two kinds of teachers. There's those that are speaking truth and those that are speaking lies. And what does Jesus tell us in verse 15? Be on your guard. Do you see it in, your, in the scriptures? Do you see it before you? Be on your guard. What is he saying? Other translations will read, be, beware or be, be alert. There's like a, a flashing sign at this point. Jesus is saying, be careful to who you allow to influence you. I can't think of a greater message in our time. Jesus shares this well over 2,000 years ago in that time. But can you consider in our time with the advancement of technology how easy it is to become influenced by all kinds of teachings? And there are some really, really uh, uh, kinds of false teachings that sound really, really enticing and really good. Have you ever been tripped up by one of them? Have you ever believed that lie until you match it against the word of God? And so I would encourage us today, church... To match every person, every influence, every voice, everything you see and read. Match it up against the word of God. To see if it's truth or if it's a lie. There's two kinds of prophets. And we're to be on the alert. Be on guard. It means all of us should be alert. All of us should be on, on guard. But especially shepherds. Especially shepherds for a moment. Father's Day is coming up. Father's Day is coming up. We're going to celebrate in a couple weeks. And what a message to, to the fathers. What a message to lead your home well. And to love those that the Lord has placed in your trust. What a message to shepherd your home. To make sure that uh, there's not false teaching or false doctrines entering your, your home and leading your family astray. And so what a message to the, to the fathers out there to know the word of God which sets us free. We need to know this word of God. If you're waiting for Sunday mornings to just know the word of God, you're missing it. You're missing it. We'll recognize them by their fruit, Jesus says, right? We'll recognize them by their fruit. Their fruit. I want to challenge you to dig deep every day into to this holy word. Dig deep. Some of you might be struggling. It might be a dry season. First, can you just admit, admit to the Lord? It's, it's a dry season. God, I need your help. Stop running from it. Stop running from the dry season and, and, start, and run, run back to him and say, Lord, help me. Help me have a greater passion for your word. Help me have a greater, greater passion for the things of your word. Consider the people that you've surrounded yourself with. Are they pushing you towards Christ? Or are they pulling you away from him? Each month we produce a reading plan. It's, it's, our, it's our hope and it's our mission to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so we want to help in any way we can. That's why, that's why we give out that right now media access to every home. So that you can bring, bring the word of God into your home or your tablets or your phones. But, but, but additionally, additionally, we have reading plans that we produce each month. There's a printed, printed copy of that in our next step area. I would encourage you to take one on the way out. Because maybe you just, you just need something. <laughs> We want to put that in your hands. You can also scan the QR code, the seat in front of you, the seat back in front of you. If you're in the house and online, there's a digital uh, copy of that reading plan. Would you take that? It's, it's June 2nd. It's only the second day. Start right now. Start today. Start this month. Don't let another month go by that you're not daily digging into the word of God to be able to decipher what's true and what is true. And what's a lie? Look to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Would you write that reference down? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves for, and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves, do you hear this? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night 
and day for three years, I never stopped warning each of you with tears. What's the context? The context is this. The Lord had used Paul mightily to establish a church in Ephesus. And he's writing back to the elders in Ephesus. And he's writing this letter to be on your guard. To be aware. He uses the same language that Jesus used to the disciples. Be on your guard because they've spent time. They've labored to begin this gospel work in Ephesus. Where cultural collides and religions of all kinds. And philosophies of all kinds. that had begun to creep into the church. And so Paul and the elders worked diligently to establish the church in the ways of the Lord with theological foundation. And his concern, his heartbeat is as he removes himself and as the Lord uses him elsewhere to beware. There's people going to creep in with all kinds of crazy ideas that at the end contradict the word of God. I'll tell you, I'm thankful to be a part of a church that has had a leadership over the years, different forms, different forms of leadership that have worked diligently to protect the theological integrity of this church. Because over 15 years, there's been a whole lot of crazy nonsense trying to creep into this church. And we're just not about to have that. And so if that's you, Hey, there's other places you can connect. It's not going to be here. I can tell you that much because we're going to match everything that is said Against the word of God, which is our truth and the authority to which we will lay down our lives for. This word, this holy word. Look to verse 17. In the same way, in the same way every good tree continues, every good tree produces good fruit. But a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Do you see that again? Recognize them by their their fruit. So these teachings, these teachings, the evidence to whom they belong to. We see the tale of two, two kinds of fruits. Two kinds of fruits, bad fruit, good fruit. I wonder what what's evident in your life. It's uh, incredibly difficult to manufacture the good fruits uh, of, of the word of God in our lives. I think we can get away for a short amount of time faking it. But to go the, but to go the distance, no. Jesus teaches, you'll recognize them by their fruit. And then the what fruit are they, the, the, what tree, what, what bad tree or, or good tree, what bad fruit or good fruit? He says, you'll recognize them by their fruit. What is that? That's the evidence of our lives. The evidence, the, what is flowing out of our lives. What do people notice in us? In, and not just in us, but what do people notice through us? Galatians chapter 5, quickly. Would you write that reference down? Galatians five nineteen says this. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. This is that old person. This is the old creation. This is uh, the, the one who belongs to, 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 to Satan and the principalities of the air. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of, of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. And anything similar, I am warning you about these things as I warned you before. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Going back to chapter 4 of Matthew. Jesus picks up where the forerunner John left off. Preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the old person. Then, then, Then look at verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the evidence. This is the evidence. Do you you belong to the Lord Jesus or not? Have you accepted the, the gospel, the gift of salvation, or have you rejected the gift of grace? Free gift of eternal life. What is the evidence 
flowing through our lives that we belong to him. Look to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, do many mirac- uh, miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. The tale of two, we find two professions. We find, find two professions. One saying, Lord, didn't I do all of this in your name? And the, and the other is like, Lord, I'm only here because of your name. <laughs> That's what Jesus is teaching here. If you recall, this entire Sermon on the Mount is to teach against the self-righteousness of the religious leaders of the day. He's saying, no, no, there's no amount of good works that you could ever do that would be good enough for the standard of perfection to enter into a perfect place called heaven. There's none. There's none. We desperately need the righteousness of God. And what's the best example of the righteousness of God? Look no further than the cross where our Savior bled and died. He was crucified for you, for me, for the the world so that we could be set free, so that we could move from that old creation to the new creation. So that the things we used to live for that are just temporary and that fade away, that there could be lasting impact eternity in heaven. Two kinds of professions. Notice that all the ideas of the last section are woven into this next section. Who are the individuals mentioned here? They are those who prophesy and and what kind of fruit is on display here? In addition to prophesying, we hear that, that they cast out demons and do miracles. Look at what we've done. And you would ask, aren't all these good things? Didn't Jesus and his disciples do these very things? And the answer is yes, they are. And yes, he and they did. But by themselves, such miracles do not confirm that a person belongs to God or is telling the truth about God. And so the conclusion of Christ's message is a call to not compromise. There's a call with, with these decisions before us, the choice before us, there is a call to not compromise, to not compromise. You and I must choose to not compromise. Choices have consequences. Look to verse 24. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet, it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great clash. The final tale of two that we see here, there are two kinds of foundations. There's two kinds of foundations. We see the first, therefore. Do you see that? In verse 24, the first word, therefore. Connecting back to what he had just previously stated. Everyone who hears these words, who hears these words, consider a moment, consider for a moment the the words of Jesus, the words that we've studied over the past 16 weeks, words of life, words of righteousness, words of calling us to be the light of the world and salt to the earth. The words to be generous people, be a generous people, but in private, not for those to applaud us. The words to pray quietly to the Lord, not with this eloquent speech so the world sees how good you are. 
the, the words of Jesus to come alongside of brothers and sisters that are struggling, that have the speck in their eye, but first remove the beam out of our own eyes. Consider the words of Jesus through the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is how he concludes. This is how he concludes. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the sand. But everyone who hears these words, who hears these words and doesn't act on them and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his, his home on the sand. Notice the imagery here that Jesus uses. We sang it a moment ago. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, pounded that house. There's hard seasons that we all walk through. Some of you are in that hard season right here, right now today. And the evidence... Do you belong to him is found in how we will react because of have we established our lives upon the rock or upon the sand? Have we lived out Jesus's words? Do we fully believe them and living them out? There's a whole lot of people that come in week after week, come in and, and, and hear the word. But the tragedy is when the church uh, doesn't live out the word. James 1.22 says this. James 1.22 says to be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. There's two, two kinds of foundations. I, I'm always encouraged in the faith when I see a brother or sister a family of God, stand firm in the hardest moments of life. That is such an encouragement to me. I think that's one of the beauties of the church. I really do. Because we need a brother and sister to come alongside of us in our moments of, of hardships and distress and, and, a, and a put an arm around the shoulder and say, keep on going. You better keep the faith. You better not turn your back on, on the living God. You've come too far. I mean, we need brothers to, and sisters to encourage us in the faith. First Corinthians says that we've been comforted. We've been comforted. In our sorrows, we've been comforted by the God of all comfort so that when others need the comfort, we can then pour it out upon them. It's one of the beauty, beautiful things of the church. When the church is being the church and living out the words, living out the words of, of Jesus. And so I wonder today, which foundation are you building your life on? Which foundation are you building your life on? And can I encourage you? And, and, and older folks in the church, I, I need your help to encourage the younger folks because oftentimes we're only thinking about ourselves and we're not thinking about the next generation to come or the generation after them to come. We're, we're, we've become a selfish people, the, the ways of the world, and we need an older generation, a wiser generation, a more mature generation, a godly generation to, to rise up and to speak truth into a younger generation and say, consider right here, right now, the decisions you're making, how they will have lasting implications on all those to follow. We need that. Some of y'all just sitting back, trying to coast through the rest of your life. Nonsense. We say quite often, if you're not dead, God is not done. There is no retirement when it comes to the spiritual life. And so I challenge you. Older generation, there is a younger generation right here among you that needs you. And so rise up. Verse 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Because he was teaching them like one who had authority. The crowds uh, that had gathered around back in chapter 5 
We see it. Jesus had just called a few of the disciples from the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They're out fishing. They're like, ah, I'm doing this the rest of my life. And Jesus is like, hey, you're going to do it like as a break, you know, because you're no longer fishing for fish as a vocation. You're fishing for people. Uh, and, and, uh, and so for all the fishermen, though, it's, it's okay. You think they never fished again. They did. We see that. You just read your Bible and you'll see that if they could, the Lord allowed them to continue to fish. All right. And so uh, it's okay. And uh, but Jesus calls these disciples and he instructs them. That's what we see in chapter five, verse one. Go back to it and read it. And so Jesus in chapter five, he sits down. He takes the place of authority and he begins to teach. That's how all of this begins. He's instructing the disciples. Hey, the crowds have gathered because of the name and fame of Jesus had spread throughout the region. And so the crowds have gathered. If I can just get close enough, there's something different about this man. I don't know what it is, but, but, but people were talking. People were talking. And so the crowds begin to gather around. And I love that Jesus didn't water down this message. He didn't go a little shallow message. No, he goes in hard. He goes in and deep with the, with, with the disciples to teach them the ways of Jesus, what it really means to enter the kingdom and to live in the kingdom. And look how it closes. Jesus had finished saying these things. The crowds were astonished at his teaching. He was teaching them like one who had Authority and not like their scribes. Matthew's emphasis is clear. Jesus spoke with authority, an authority which was unfamiliar to the crowds. You know, the best sermon ever reveals more than just a righteous path. It reveals, it reveals, don't miss this, a righteous Lord who speaks authoritatively about real righteousness and who will one day be a righteous judge condemning unrighteous imposters. The wise builder is not simply a person who accepts the wisdom of Jesus' teaching and does nothing with it. The guidance of Jesus does us no good unless we follow it. R.T. France said this, the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is not meant to be admired. Don't miss this. It's not meant to be admired, but to be obeyed. It's meant to be obeyed. And so how will we obey him? How will we follow? How will we follow after him? Every choice matters. Every decision that we make matters. I was thinking about this early this morning that um, I had a decision to make after high school just over 20 years ago. And, and one of my mentors, my father's here today. I love him and appreciate him so much. Look up to him so much. Dad, I was remembering this this morning, as I was thinking about how all the choices we make matter. <laughs> After high school, I had this, this path that I thought was the path that I was going. Anyone ever had a path and it's like, maybe you considered God in it? <laughs> and so I had this path. I, 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 was, I loved soccer. I was passionate about soccer. Started talking with different colleges. And so the decision came down, do I, do I pursue soccer or am I going to wholly surrender to the Lord and his call in my life? And, and, and I'm so thankful, Dad, that I made that decision with you and Mom, your guidance, and, and others to, to go and to get that biblical education. And just how God works in the decisions that we make, I made that decision by the grace of God. And, and then Dad calls me my first semester in college, and he says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at this church in this small country town outside of Gainesville. Go Gators. FSU fans. And, and I, uh, he says, do you want to come? Will you come? Because there's nothing happening for, for kids. And there are kids all over this small town that need to hear about Jesus. And so we talked about it. We prayed about it. And I could continue my theological education away from actually being up in the panhandle. And, and so I said, yes. And, and about a year into it, I, I 
sat down in dad's office one day and I said, dad, I really want to take a group overseas, get them away from this small town, right? And I really want to develop some leaders. And, and I think the best way to do that would be to go overseas. And, 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 and my youth pastor, who dad served with for, for many years in Orlando, was pastoring a church. I didn't even know where he was pastoring. And so we talked about it. And we had heard that he was taking teams to Jamaica every year. And, and, so, and so he said, Let's, let, why don't you call him? And so I, I got his number and I called him. And would you believe that this pastor, my youth pastor growing up, was in Fort Pierce of all places? I had never heard of Fort Pierce. I grew up in Orlando, never heard of Fort Pierce. And, uh, and so I was thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about this this morning, how every choice matters. And, and so I, I called him. We put a team together. We came down to Fort Pierce to go serve the Lord in Jamaica with a, a, a church in Fort Pierce. And would you believe that Audra was a part of that team? And of course, when I saw her, I thought, man, she's beautiful. But would you believe that just two weeks before me coming to Fort Pierce on this trip, I broke up with a girl. I just, nice girl. And if you're watching, you, you genuinely nice girl. Uh, but I just knew she wasn't the one for me. I just knew it. She wasn't the one for me. Hard decision. Made that decision two weeks before we came to Fort Pierce and I met Audra. And on that trip, serving the Lord Jesus and sharing the gospel with children, the Lord started something. And we fell in love. Side note, she was dating someone. <laughs> November, we celebrate 18 years of marriage, praise God. <laughs> and so... Uh, but, but here, here I, I mean, every decision matters. And so I, I went back to dad and said, I, I love this girl. And, and we talked about what it would look like. I said, she's not moving. <laughs> and if you know Audrey, yeah, yeah, we're here, okay? <laughs> Planted in Fort Pierce. <laughs> I said, dad, I think she's the one. And I don't know what the Lord has for me. But at this point, this youth ministry was thriving. I mean, we went from eight youth when I started to over 80 in two years and it was just exploding and God was so gracious to us but I made the hard decision to follow the Lord and came to Fort Pierce started serving in a local church volunteering there was no position available just volunteering worked three jobs we got married became got, got on staff in this church and the Lord began stirring within me this desire to plant a work. Dad had been a church planter. I'd seen it. I was five years old. We're moving chairs around. And it's like, in, I guess it's in me. <laughs> and so closing the story with this. Every decision that we make matters. Because then the Lord in his grace and his kindness allowed us, a few people that are with us today, whom I love dearly. Decided that the Lord had called me to something. And we're going to step out on faith. And so this past April, we celebrated 15 years of God's goodness in ministry right here on the Treasure Coast. But I think back through all of it, how every choice matters. Every choice has consequences, good and bad. I want to close. I want to close with this, this one more story. This one's written. As Edward Moat was walking to work one day in 1834, the thought popped into his head to write a hymn on the gracious experience of a Christian. As he walked up the road, he had the course. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. By the end of the day, he had the first four verses written out and safely tucked away in his pocket. 
Later that week, he visited his friend whose wife was very ill. And as they couldn't find a hymnal to sing from, he dug up his newly written verses and sang those with the couple. The wife enjoyed them so much, she asked for a copy. And Moat went home to finish the last two verses and sent it off to a publisher saying, As these verses so met the dying woman's case, my attention to them was the more arrested. And I had a thousand printed for distribution. Listen to the words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this place. Online with us, would you do the same? Just for a moment, would you pause? Don't think about anything else. Don't, don't, don't consider the rest of your day or, or, or week. Would you just focus on the Lord Jesus for a moment? Would you just say, Lord, what, what, what is my response from all of this? What is my response? Perhaps some of you are making a decision right now. And you need the wisdom of the Lord. You need to hear one voice. And it's the voice of our Lord. So all across the place, those online, you say, Lord, what is my response? What is my response? As people are praying and asking the Lord, I wonder if there's someone here, someone has joined us today that, You've never surrendered your life over to Jesus. And can I tell you, that's the starting point of all of it. To acknowledge that you're a sinner and he is the Savior. And to trust him. To forgive you of all your sins. Would you say something like that to him from your heart to the Lord's? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. And today I trust you completely. Here's my life. I believe in you. You came to this earth. You died on a cross. You, were, you rose victorious from the grave for me. And so today I trust you. Today I trust you. Save me. Save me. Would you thank him? As we sing this song, there's going to be men and women in the different corners. In this room that would love to pray with you. You're going through a decision. You're going through a challenging time. I want to encourage you as we sing this song to, to step out of your seat and, and come to one of these corners and men with men, women with women and allow someone to pray for you. Maybe you made that decision to surrender over to the Lord Jesus today. Would you let us know? Step out of your seat in just a moment. Would you step out and, and come to one of these corners and let us know. Let us pray over you and encourage you. You're wondering what your next step is. Would you have the courage to step out of your seat? As we sing, step out of your seat. Move as the Spirit of God leads you to move. If you're online, there's a host. He wants to come alongside and pray and help you. Would you stand to your feet and move as the Spirit of God leads you to move today? What is your decision? What choice is before you? Will you trust Him? Are you building your life?